Hello, welcome to the next episode of the TFR community. If you are keeping an eye on the Linux Word, you might be aware of the $200,000 donation that was made by the Pineapple Fund to the KDE community. Now, that's a decent amount of money. So do you wonder that, how is the KDE community planning to use that money? And, and the bigger question is, who manages all these funds that come to the KDE community? There is an organization behind the KDE community, it's called KDEV. And today we are going to talk to two amazing people from the KD community. I have known them forever, but interestingly, I have never met them in person. And, and I have met a lot of KD people, but not these two. So today we are going to talk to Lydia, who is the president of the KD board and former vice president, Sebastian. So let's meet Lydia and Sebastian. So here we are, we are talking to the KD community. We have Lydia with us and we have Sebastian with us. Before we kind of uh, deep dive into this interview, uh, Lydia, can you please tell us a bit about what is KDE EV and what is EV stands for? I, I have lived in Germany, so I do know, but just for our you know viewers. Um, so KDE EV is the organization that supports the KDE community. For example, in legal matters, in financial matters, organization um, of events and uh, similar things. And the EV stands for Eingetragener Verein, um, which is German roughly for uh, registered nonprofit. Right. Uh, and, and when you said that, you know, uh, to, to support the KD community, uh, what kind of support are we talking about? Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, we are paying for the servers that uh, the code is being developed on and hosted on. Um, we are uh, helping to organize academy or annual event, um, development sprints, other contributor sprints. Um, that, those are among the things that uh, the EV does. Okay, and and uh, before we talk about this, you know, mysterious and magical two hundred thousand dollar donation, uh, what kind of funding and sponsorship is already there? What kind of model do you have to sponsor and fund the whole project and operations that you're running there? Because KD is one of the, I think, one of the oldest and also one of the most mature and one of the biggest, you know, open source projects out there. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Um... KDEV gets its funding from uh, a number of different sources. Um, the one that's closest to my heart is individual people contributing um, 5 euro, 10 euro, 100 euro because they like our software and they want to um, advance our course and, and make that software available to more people. Um, and another way that, um, that uh, KDEV is financed is through the membership fees of our patrons. So those are companies um, that value our code and the work we do and, and want to support that financially. And um, a third thing is uh, sponsorship of Academy, our annual event. Um, so there it's mostly companies who, who want to support the event and, and the meeting of our contributors and, and allow them to work together. Right. Uh, is there any kind of participation or funding from any uh, public bodies like governments or local administrations or something like that or is all everything is totally privately funded um we were part of eu research projects in the past but right now uh, we're not okay oh, well <laughs> this is that's, I I say, um uh, there's another angle to that story um because um there is hardly any direct financial contributions by govern governments or um, or nonprofits, but they do contribute in kind. So, uh, for example, we have the uh, Limux project, which is the um, Linux operating system group um, in the city of Munich, which has switched to open source fully. Um, they've been contributing for, I think, at least five years um, actively stream uh, by providing feedback but also by uh, by uh, fixing things by actively participating and um, they've also um, directly or indirectly been contributing uh, code by fixed by paying contractors to uh, to do so um, another really good example for that uh, is the German government where um, there's a 
um, group under the ministry, um, well, there's, there's a digital security group and they've been funding um, work on KML, on the email client, uh, on security infrastructure, on strong cryptography. Um, so there, there is actual participation by uh, governmental organizations, but it's not in hard cash. Okay, and uh, I, 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 I don't want to kind of discuss, but uh, with the Linux Linux project, we heard that uh, because the mayor changed and he's pro Microsoft person, and they are planning to go back to. Uh, uh, so how does that affect the project and their involvement with the KD community? Um, so far, it's um, well. This is a political process, and it's going rather slowly. So, um, the news has reached us, but the consequences haven't. Uh, so, um, there's uh, still active contribution um, uh, to upstream plasma. Uh, we okay. uh, still receive bug fixes. Um, so, while on the one end we're actually very sad for um, for all the politics uh, involved, which well seem to be fishy um we are still working with them actively to to actually achieve their goals um so the new uh, the rollout of the new client um is waiting they've been switching uh, to plasma 5 um over the past years and um this is what's actually going on uh, behind the scenes when you ignore politics for a while uh, so there's a very fruitful healthy relationship mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in addition some... to what to what Seba said, um, like the politics behind this is a shame, right? Um, but the nice thing about this is this is not the end of our work, right? KDE mm -hmm. is spread out over so many people, so many organizations. Um, that one organization pulling out isn't isn't the end of KDE, and and we will continue to provide great software to everyone mm -hmm. who wants it. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a nice thing not to put all the eggs in the same basket or whatever you say. Uh, well, and, and um, of course, another really interesting angle is that um, the work that has been done as part of uh, as part of the Linux project isn't lost. It's actually mm -hmm. still um, benefiting the uh, the general public because it doesn't um, end up in some uh, proprietary code base that's never going to be used again. Um, it is available for for all users and in fact um plasma 5.12 which has just been released contains a whole number of improvements that have been directly um uh sponsored by the Linux project um for example multi-screen uh support for for folder view right yeah the way i see it that you know uh you there are two ways to contribute to any open source project either cash or code so either you're contributing through code or you're contributing cash and that's what mostly happens whether it's company or i i think that's a way to limit a view um because um there's a whole lot um more work that we're doing yes yes i i i, I, I agree i totally agree yeah, there is a lot of other work yeah totally uh, it's not but just, there's, but there's I, the, in the larger the scale. in kind, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, now, uh, when, I mean, uh, when we look at, you, you talked about the latest uh, version of Plasma. There was a time when there was used to be confusion around the naming and the versioning, uh, but I, everything has settled down. Now people still talk about, hey, I'm a KD user. No, you are a Plasma user. KD is a big community. Uh, but uh, uh, when we look at the new version of plasma uh, plasma okay this is some i'll jump too much on too many far because i'm a fiction writer no also, so I'll no jump jump on. around a lot of things uh, because i cover a lot of enterprise space uh, and when i go to all these conferences whether it's openstack or docker i uh, see you know where the word is moving uh, and, and sadly, what I see on the stage, uh, unless and until it's a Red Hat uh, Summit or a SUSECon, uh, whether it's DockerCon or OpenStack Summit or no matter KubeCon, all I see is Mac OS is even on the... No, there was no Mac OS on Linux Foundation, so that whole garbage was nonsense. There was I'm no, not even Jim Zemlin. Uh, <laughs> no, he was not. No, he uh, he may be using it privately. Everybody uses you know Mac OS privately. I mean, I am recording right now on Mac OS. Uh, but what I mean to say is that uh, all the developers, they use Mac OS. They, I have talked to a lot of people. So so my question to you is that when you look at the, the desktop, uh, 
what what is your target audience and when you look at all these events that they are using mac so how do you how, how what do you feel about it how, and how do you plan to actually understand their problems and then try to solve them so that uh, when I see them using macOS, I actually don't see their failure. I see failure of the desktop that is not capable to handle their workload. So, so f my question to you is that, how do you plan to change the landscape so that more and more uh, such open source people are use you know uh, KDE or Linux desktop on their systems and not macOSs? Um. So that's that's actually to um two really important, uh, though fairly general things that we're, uh, that we're concentrating on. Um, mm -hmm. One is um, somewhat the conservative angle that we're uh, trying to make the software more solid, um, mm. um, easier uh, to use. So, uh, so we are, we're polishing a lot. And um, I think in that regard, uh, we've been actually doing really well and our public perception uh, shows that as well. So we've been, uh, really getting um, good reviews. Uh, there's lots of positive vibes around uh, around Plasma, and uh, our our users and future users really seem to appreciate the uh, the strategy of um, polishing the current code base, making it faster, making it slicker, uh, fixing bugs, and then um, starting this process over and, and fixing more of that. And in fact. Um, I think this really speaks to one of the core values uh, in KDE, which we actually haven't been doing so well in uh, maybe in the past years, but uh, now we have um, overhauled um, our platform for a few years uh, with the introduction of KDE frameworks and also the Plasma 5 architecture. Um, we are having um, a series of years um, still to come where we can keep polishing without larger architectural changes because we have actually invested a lot of time and effort in future proofing the underlying code base. So um, my positive takeaway from that is that um, with all the hardship we, we faced, especially when we introduced um, the first version of Plasma, uh, we now have a, a long streak of um, what really matters to uh, to users and what's, what gets us uh, positive feedback. We're fixing, 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 improving, and uh, and polishing. And um, by the feed feedback we're getting now, especially about the 5.12 release, which is really about stability and performance, um, this is exactly what, what users expect from us. And uh, mm -hmm. this is also a message that they can really appreciate while it's much harder to communicate to them that um, there is underlying work to be done before we can actually reach this uh, this stage where we can build up on a modern stack for uh, for a few years. Um, right. That is the the um, retrospective, um, the conservative angle on that. But we're also looking um, looking forward, and um, this one aspect uh, which is really close to uh, to my heart and to my belief system actually that's the privacy angle um, I think that um, what this world really needs is um, the tools to to protect um, yourself to, right um, the tools that give you the possibility of leading a private life um, because complete, um, openness and exposure of private data has become the default. And while the situation isn't that bad right now, I think um, things like uh, identity theft um, are going to become a really huge problem. Uh, we already saw in the past few, uh, in the past year uh, that uh, large governmental organizations um, have have their computers kidnapped. Um, there were hospitals uh, which had been pretty much remotely shut down. Um, and this is this is the, uh, the cyber war, which um, most people actually do not fully understand right now, which, which is going to be a really big problem. Um, and that's the anticipating uh, angle. We're building the tools right now and rallying uh, the community behind ourselves to um, 
to build strong software that can help defend you against these things. Uh, I totally agree with you on the on the privacy and security. A lot of things are going on. Uh, but the, the bigger challenge and the big question is that uh, no matter how good the tool is, if nobody is using it, what is the point, you know? So, so as, as much as, you know, uh, your focus is on, uh, I mean, for example, if everybody's using Facebook, it doesn't really matter, you know, whether you're running on KD or Gnomes, you know, or you're logged into a Gmail account. So it defies the whole purpose. Uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, uh, desktop Linux has always been, you know, kind of uh, 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 not that much a success. Linux is successful everywhere else. So, so how do you plan to put uh, KD desktop in more people's hand? Because people want the they use computer to get the work done. That right. is their primary goal. You know, uh, everything else comes secondary. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so, so when you look at all these users. How do you really plan to make it easier for them to, to get their work done so that they can, once they use the platform and the, the, the mind share of that platform increases, then you can actually help people with their privacy things because otherwise everybody will be running Windows and Mac OS. Maybe 1% people are using uh, the, the desk, Linux desktop, but that defies the whole purpose. Right. Um, so where we, where we see this uh, going is this, that um the class of desktop computers and um uh and full scale laptops is actually decreasing and um their use cases are becoming more limited um but uh so where where are people moving they're moving to smartphones um but they're also moving to um more purpose driven embedded hardware and this is actually where one of the focus areas um, especially of Plasma, but also the underlying libraries uh, is lying. So we've been doing a lot of uh, work on uh, creating the Plasma mobile uh, platform. Um, not much of that is visible right now, but uh, to make our software run really well on, on smaller and embedded devices, uh, there's not just uh, a different UI needed, the software needs to be a lot leaner. Uh, so we've right. been uh, spending a lot of time on optimizing uh, Plasma on optimizing startup time, on optimizing memory usage, especially in the uh, in the last months, um, to make it easier to run Plasma on these uh, on these smaller systems, and uh, that is very much um, work that will benefit us uh, in the future. But the good news is it also improves the um, the software today. So, um, for example, um, a small group of us of about 10 people had a meeting in December where we sit down in a really nice castle somewhere in somewhere in snowy Germany and um, spent a week on optimizing the hell out of uh, out of plasma we made it made it start up a lot faster um, and uh, optimized memory usage uh, this is the kind of uh, kind of boring work to the general public but it's actually really important um, for people that have high expectations of their software um, and that may want to run it on smaller and, and embedded devices. That said, I, I agree with you. Um, we're not really good enough um, at getting the word out right now. Um, we are professionalizing our marketing department a lot more, but in the end, it's just so much we can do. How much effort do we want, do we want to spend on marketing and how much effort do we want to spend on actually improving the software and then um, in my opinion, and that's, I think, the right thing to do, um, improving the software should always win because uh, once you have a really good product, um, it will spread itself. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's a tricky situation that, yeah, too much uh, money towards marketing, but not, but at the same time, if uh, sometimes what happens is if, if marketing works, uh, works and like look at Elon Musk from, you know, from uh, SpaceX and, you know, Tesla. Uh, he is great at marketing. He, I mean, I don't know what he thinks or what he really believes in, but I think moving to Mars, I mean, when there is a drought in California, you cannot fix that and you think about moving everybody to Mars. But I think what he's trying to do is he's just getting everybody excited about his SpaceX company. That's what he's doing. What's the name again, sorry? Elon Musk for the SpaceX who sends the rockets in the space. 
Elon Musk. You have not oh, heard right. of. Oh, right. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So he's talking about moving everybody to Mars, but I think he's just getting us excited about science one more. He doesn't yeah. plan to go to Mars. Same thing he's doing with the with the. Uh, with his boring company, which is digging, actually they are starting in the DC also. So from DC to New York, it will be just 29 minutes. You know, it takes hours. And right. then he sold that frame flamethrower, you know, and he made like $10 million in like two days. The whole idea is to getting people excited when people get, so when you do put money in marketing, it should not, it's not like money, but when you get people excited about something, then you also get mind share. When you get mind share, then you get users. When you get users, you get developers. When you get developers, then they work on the ecosystem. And when you get the ecosystem, that's what you want in the end. So I think it's, yeah, it's, you do need, you know, smart people like him or Steve Jobs who can get people excited about technology without actually making any compromises with the technology in general. So I do think, you know, marketing, but you have to be smart enough to, to do that. Otherwise, you might end up making a lot of mistakes that uh, uh, unfortunately Canonical made in past with their phone edge project where we created too much hype, but they failed to deliver it. Yeah, that's uh, exactly anyway. the reason why we're yeah. uh, why we're spending our European Friday afternoon talking to you to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, and, the sec and second thing while talking about castles, yeah, when, because we, I live in Germany, Garmisch, and it's like every time we open a car, there will be a castle next door. <laughs> Let's get back to the money part. So now you guys just got an, you know, a huge pile of money. I don't know where it came from. So can you talk about that? What, what, what's going on there? Um, yeah, maybe I, I can talk a bit about this. Um, so the Pineapple Fund is... Uh, um, a guy who made a lot of um, bitcoins in the early days of bitcoins, and now is uh, giving it away to nonprofits that um, he cares about. And um, KD is one of the organizations that applied and were selected for 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 a donation. And we we got um, two hundred thousand um, dollars from from him, and that is the biggest donation KD EV has ever gotten. Um, and that is pretty cool. We're, we're very yeah, excited yeah. about that and hope so, to put it to good mm, use for the community. Yeah. So should, should I should I set up an organization as a nonprofit and I may get some checks and bits from him? Uh, so how are you? Okay, um, I don't know whether you can you can talk about it or not, but I do think Katie shares that. So what is your annual? You know, other was traditionally how much you know funding that you get every year. Um. I would have to look up the exact numbers. Um, I don't have them here, but this this is about doubling our current um, money. Okay, and from what Sebastian told me earlier that most of this money goes toward actual development work and not too much towards marketing and all those stuff. So when you say uh, development work, uh, from KD's perspective, the way I look at it, it's mostly, you know, volunteers are there. Uh, so where do you use this money? How, uh, how does, I mean, uh, for the, I mean, you talked about events are there, but do you also have like full-time developers or graphic designers or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so can you talk about that? That Right. What is the, so, yeah. KD's current money um, does not go towards development. Um, we have uh, one person paid part time to assist the board um, and the community with organizational um, matters, and two people contracted to uh, support our marketing team. Um, beyond that, there's no people who are paid by KDEV to work on KDE uh, topics. Okay. Now, with this money, um, we are having the discussions now how to use this money in the most impactful way for, for KDE. Um, and among the things that are being discussed is hiring to, uh, people to do specific things um, or contracting people to do specific things. Um, for example, um, doing documentation cleanups um, or doing uh, usability tests or helping us with marketing research and things like that. Uh, when you say documentation, uh, I am not because I have actually not looked much into documentation because I don't need any kind of documentation. <laughs> it's kind of uh, uh, is it just in one language or multiple languages as well? Um, we do have uh, some of the user do uh, documentation translated in mm -hmm. many languages. Yes, right. um, the developer documentation I believe is mostly in English. 
yeah because that's kind of universal language so uh in in addition to that as we were like talking to sebastian earlier that uh, there, there are some core areas which do need to be addressed you know to make you know linux desktop more appealing uh, and since now you do have a big chunk of money uh, so why do you think documentation is uh, that important instead of let's say getting a developer who can you know really do a lot of dedicated work on either mobile platform or maybe a graphics guy who can you know improve the overall stack uh, because i don't really know how many people actually i mean i never read any manual to be honest i buy a camera I, they, they send a big thick manual but i never read it so how do you really prioritize that okay this is more important than this and that so what we're right. trying to um, what we're trying to do is invest in multipliers. Um, if you've got two hundred thousand um, dollars and you invest it into C plus plus software development, you won't get very far. Mm -hmm. um, what we are trying to do is make it easy and appealing for volunteer developers to uh, to chip in, and then um, two hundred thousand dollars can mm -hmm. actually get you very far so that's true um we look at these these areas that are that are weak um that um can get a big boost from uh from a one time or uh, perhaps longer term but um rather low-key amount of money and we try to um use these as multipliers to get the word out uh to people and um documentation happens to be one of these areas that is uh underrepresented underrepresented and that uh really eats into developer time um it also uh, needs a different skill set uh, so if you ask a software developer to write user documentation uh you get incomprehensible documentation also i know yeah um, you are wasting the time of someone with a different skill set to do something which the person really doesn't like so much. So you're making it on the one hand, um, uh, you're going for a um, less than optimal result. And on the other hand, you're boring a volunteer developer leading to a quicker burnout. So we want the people that are developing to be able to concentrate on development uh, as much as possible. Um, so the money will typically go into um, organizing meetings for these people uh, on uh, running a smooth organization, on running infrastructure that can make these people uh, productive. Because um, the funny thing is that um, there are actually enough people around that really like to do software development. It just needs to be appealing. It doesn't. It must not be something like a deep up where you are. Um, where you're lacking documentation, where you where you're uh, working with really slow, under maintained infrastructure, where you're um, running into political issues all the time. So we're trying to smoothen out the overall organization uh, to make development as much fun as possible, and that allows us to get the really talented uh, people in our community to be uh, to be really productive right I mean, yeah yeah please go ahead um so exactly as Seba said right if we enable what if we pay one person to to write code for example um then that only gets us so far but if we pay someone to make it easier for a hundred developers to join That's us true. and and uh, yeah. write code right that that gets us much much further um, so we are looking exactly into those things that have much more long-term and um, organizational impact. Yeah, and, and then it has always been a community-driven project, so you would really not want, you know, KD employees, you know, developing software. It will also be, I think, it may also discourage a lot of people uh, that somebody is getting paid to do the same code that I'm writing in my free time. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Uh, documentation is there we have covered our monies uh so now you have tasted this much money <laughs> uh, um, uh, what other efforts are there uh, because uh, kd is still uh, i think mostly europe centric uh, how do you plan to kind of uh, grow beyond europe so that people you know from north america or australia or other you know rich countries 
can also kind of participate and uh, give more money which can help it so uh, uh, that just of the question is how do you plan to grow beyond your traditional you know strong castle is which is in europe <laughs> right. um, so there is like actually already a pretty strong community in india for example uh, that is re regularly organizing conferences that are yeah really big right. and, and really successful and try, uh, get a lot of new people in um there is a brazilian community for example that is um doing conferences local meetups and and so on um so there, there is that already and we one of the things we're trying to do is make that much more visible right and and um encourage more people to to do that and to join in i mean north america is has always been a big market for you know so how do you really plan i mean look at red hat they are so big because you know they are the king of the north if i can use the analogy from game of throne uh, so how do you really uh, i mean do you have any plans for moving uh, kind of yeah, increasing um, so the U.S. market has been um, very much a problematic thing for us all the time. Um, I I agree with Lydia. I wouldn't say that um, KD is certainly Europe um, has a strong community in Europe, but uh, just looking at it, there's Europe and there's uh, there's the U.S. is um, missing a very large part of the world. Uh, so uh, yeah, we got a community in India, in uh, um, in Latin America. Um, actually, Latin America tends to. You know, we also see that um, in Spain, this tends to be its own ecosystem um, because there's actually a critical mass of uh, Spanish or Brazilian Portuguese speaking uh, people. So it doesn't need to be very outward looking. Um, it can be very. Uh, very much uh, self-contained. I mean, Brazil is huge, both in terms of um, uh, of actual geographical size, but also in terms of software. And having been uh, to uh, to Brazil for a few times, uh, free software is huge there. Uh, that said, you're completely right, and um, we really haven't been able to get a foot in the door uh, in the U.S. And um, a lot of that has to do with a critical mass. Um, I have a number of projects that I know about that um, we're trying to actually get a critical mass going uh, in the US or, uh, or in North America. And none of that has really, um, has really been successful uh, so far. Um, I, I honestly don't really know at this point how um, how we can uh, approach that uh, that market um, because then it's also very hard for us uh, for us to grasp. Um, it seems very close by culturally, but then um, especially in terms of community involvement, um, the differences are are huge and something that uh, works really well um, in Europe. Uh, for example, presence uh, at events um, is completely different uh, in the US. And I guess that, that we, are, we really have this strong cultural divide, which doesn't help us a lot. So um, yeah. yeah, we need some really cool people in the US that really understand these community dynamics and that uh, can help us get going. Yeah, I mean, when I look at all the commercial open source uh, um, they, they, they are you know all they are mostly u.s based they, they, they are growing a lot in asia but the thing with the u.s is that uh, even if brazilian market is big it's not an influential market for the rest of the world you know uh, but u.s kind of becomes an influential market i mean Elon musk is a south Amer Af african but he moved to u.s and now everybody around the world talks about his spacex you know because it's uh, uh, india does israel european have their own but nobody talks about that so somehow u.s also becomes an influential you know kind of you know in big influence over everybody else so uh, so being active in the us yes I, it can help a lot in the growth of the project as well but it's a hard net to crack but the thing is us is a is a place uh, i mean not in the current political situation uh, because yesterday they just the, the the they removed that us is a land of immigrants from their you know uh, department i think the homeland security or whatever it is they yep. removed it from their official statement so things are changing here uh, it's funny because SuzeCon is moving to Vancouver, LinuxCon is moving to Vancouver, and then OpenStack Summit is moving to Vancouver. So nobody wants to come to US anymore. 
because of this current so there is a lot of political but i yeah but i think north america because of the english language it can be helpful honestly you know i i can actually appreciate uh, appreciate the the irony in that because um, i was talking about the the privacy and security angle earlier on and probably the countries that would um need software that can solve these problems most is the us exactly mm-hmm. and um that also has this um radiating effect on the rest of the world because the uh, weak standards about privacy and data security from the US easily bleed over into other countries um, through t- trade agreements, but also through uh, just, you know, cultural influence that is um, that the that US culture is seen as um, as an example of how it could be done or um, in the worst case, what you can actually get away with. Right. Uh- I would just like uh, the, when we do talk about U.S. influence. I was at OpenStack Summit in Australia the the uh, last year, and uh, of course it's the Austin. You know, it started from Austin, te- Texas, and uh, I met the director of IT of China Railways. They are using you know OpenStack. They are a big big user of you you know open source and OpenStack. I met Tencent, which is you know three major Chinese vendors that they are the one who powered WeChat you know platform, and they use OpenStack and open source. So everybody is moving because, as I said once again, you know, for some reason, Americans somehow know how to, to how to uh, the language plays a big role. Uh, they know how to market package. And when I go to all these conferences, I get amazed that, you know, at one end we have desktop Linux, but nobody talks about. And at the end, everything else everybody using is open source. I mean, they don't even talk about uh, closed source technologies at all. They, it, it, they won't consider anything which is not open source, period. China is building their own public cloud to compete with Amazon based on, you know, open source private cloud. So yeah, it's yeah, amazing. That, that's actually yes. a huge success story because when I when I started getting into open source, it was, um, it was basically open source against proprietary uh, code and um, and open source of free software is very much the underdog. And yeah, um, if anything, we've clearly won uh, won this battle. Um, but instead of celebrating that um, there is no way around um, the development, the open development model, and uh, actually reusing your your source code, we need to look at the next challenge, and that, in my opinion, is, is data security and privacy, where we can make a real impact on people. And um, when we, when the free software uh, movement started out, nobody was aware of the challenges that it would solve. And right now, everybody has moved to it. So it's, it has, open source has become the industry industry standard um, yes. um, in order to to win the next battle. And in that case, it doesn't matter if it's going to be or any other piece of free software that solves these things. Um, we need to make, make an impact there to solve real problems. Because in the end, I'm not doing this to advance Plasma or the KDE community. I, right. Because I have a strong belief in um, that there are real problems to solve. Right. While you do talk about, you know, the next stage, uh, uh, when we look at from the pers- from the perspective of platforms, uh, uh, we are moving towards the V uh, world, which is moving towards VR, virtual reality. I have a PlayStation and everything, which is VR. I watch VR a lot. Uh, we are moving towards an IoT-driven world, which we are more and more devices are becoming smarter. Uh, so, so, so uh, when we look at the future, where you know everything will, the Tesla, I mean, the cars will be, you know, the computers on wheel, you know, basically. So, so when we look at the future, this is the future we are going to live in. So, how prepared are you as a KD, you know, KD community, one, to either be running in the devices, number two, to become a platform for developers which they can use to create either services or software or content for this platform. So these are two. So, so from your point of view, where do you stand for in that future? Yeah. Um, so, um, there's a few, uh, there's a few interesting projects, uh, projects going on, which, um, one of which we, um, actually have talked about a lot already, which is plasma mobile and the general effort on, uh, making, uh, the KD frameworks and plasma te- technology more friendly to embedded systems. Um, but, and we haven't actually talked about uh, that a lot. We also started uh, the discussions to partner with a 
um, company that is building smart speakers, um, which is one of the hugest, uh, quickest, exactly that. Yeah. Quickest growing uh, markets uh, right now. So um, I can't actually talk about a lot about that, but um, uh, probably within the next week, um, there will be, uh, within the next week's news will be out that uh, Katie is going to partner. Um, with a company that uh, that builds uh, smart speakers on uh, based on uh, open source technology, and um, there are some efforts uh, uh, in this field going on. But yeah, we're um, we're looking at these new markets that are um, that are popping up, that are developing. We're looking at how we how we can contribute um, to the uh, goals of the companies that we believe get it. Uh, right, that build on free software that respect privacy and data security. Right. So we're trying to make an make an impact there. Yeah, I mean, like I think even mobile phone is just a placeholder before you know. Like I'm wearing the AirPods, so I actually yep. don't need my phone at all. It just sits in a corner. I just wear it across the home, and I wear a watch, and I don't need my phone. Yep. And when these, and then you, we have these, you know, smart speakers. Uh, I have never actually bothered to to open the web to ask for something. You know, I just talk to it and I get my answers. And uh, uh, but when you talk about uh, uh, these platforms, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence is going to play a big role in this space. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think what you're talking about is building the platform, but you know, uh, like Google has open source TensorFlow, which is their machine learning, deep learning platform. They've also uh, released Kubeflow, which is to manage your, uh, what you're talking, maybe we can talk next week, because uh, the platform itself is not good enough unless until you have some machine learning capabilities or data to actually, you know, feed back into the, the smart speaker. Uh, so that could be another area where we can talk about, you know, that is software stack is not as important as that having data. So if you don't have data, that um, there's actually different aspects for us. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we, um, we are happy to work with people who are directly contributing towards our long-term goals of, um, mm -hmm. uh, basically creating a better world for, uh, right. people, providing more freedom to people. There's also, um, short and midterm benefits, uh, like if we um, can collaborate with companies that um, aren't building everything using our technologies, but that just need a library to solve a certain problem, for example, to download mm -hmm. a calendar and uh, to pass the data out of it, um, then these companies um, could be interested in one of the, the uh, literally hundreds of libraries we're we are providing and contributing um, back to that, and that, that also has huge benefit uh, for us, both in terms of code contribution, but also in terms of, um, in marketing terms, because uh, that actually gets uh, the word out. Um, if this company is using it, then this must be kind of um, useful. So others will do so as well. So we're, we're actually growing our ecosystem uh, with that, and we're creating network effects. So um, there's really a lot of different, um, sometimes more subtle ways where we can benefit from the uh, from collaborating with others right 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 uh, yeah because that is a word uh, that's why I, I, I run a platform called TFIR which is the fourth industrial revolution which is all powered by software driven stuff and st uh, so this is an area where I'm keeping my eyes on you know the emerging technology that are coming up so that will be an interesting and we can certainly we should talk about it whenever you have something more concrete about it and sure. KDE has always been kind of you know uh, from the early days also uh, a lot of in the, in the desktop space you know you guys were doing a lot of things which were like later on implemented by Apple in Mac OS and my Microsoft and Windows and everything else. So you guys have always been ahead of the curve because, you know, it's a big diverse community from people from all around the globe. You know, they are bringing, you know, their ideas to the community. So no one can match that either way. You know, that's your strength, you know, and it's open source. So anybody can just come in and join in and throw the idea and start writing the code. Yeah, interesting thing is that we're um, in some areas we're very much ahead of the curve, but um, also our core business is being just um behind the curve the commoditization uh of technology so um we see that that um some innovations are um at first only available to a very small group of people that um that uh pay for it or, or where the software has huge restrictions on either geographical uh, spread or 
the demographic that it uh, that it reaches, and um, then people come along and implement a free software solution that is at first solving the same problem um, and then regard it to be more flexible and a better solution. So um, in that light, we are um, making, we are behind the curve in terms of technology, but um, we're making uh, this technology available to a much, much larger group of people. That's true, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, before, uh, anything else that you think we should discuss about in terms of this uh, big funding? Or I think we have we have covered a lot of broad topics, and we should always leave a lot of things for the next one so that we can continue to have more conversations. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> um, first, I'm sure we we won't run out of topics anytime soon. Yes. Um, right. Yeah. Then, with respect to the uh, to the funding topics, where um, we're very much looking into how we how we can uh, use it uh, in the best possible uh, way right now. Um, we're not just throwing money uh, out of the window. Uh, we're really looking at where where can make the uh, the biggest impact, and um, so this isn't the thing that uh, just plays for uh, for a week. Yeah, and if you do plan to throw the money out of window, just tell me where you are throwing it. I'll be there behind the window standing. Uh, it's probably, <laughs> I, I, I think the general consensus is that uh, Lydia gets uh, gets her own um, KDE EV Ferrari and, uh, <laughs> and uh, will be done with it. Yeah I, yeah, I think she has a private jet or something like that in Berlin. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm such a little A much, much bigger uh, donation for that, but I think it's around very much uh, reachable now. Yeah. Okay, so Lydia, any more closing words before we wrap up this interview? Thanks so much. Um, we should definitely um, continue this at some point. Um, hopefully soon when we um, decided on the first things to invest in and... Uh, Let's see what it brings for Katie. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for your time. And I, I look forward to meeting you all. In I have met a lot of community members in person, but not you two. So I am looking forward to coming to Academy and you know covering it and doing a lot of videos there and talking all the stories. That would so be awesome. Again, th yeah, thanks for your time and uh, see you. Very cool. See you. Bye. 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 Thanks for watching. That was a great discussion about Katie. And as we discussed, in future, uh, we'll be talking a lot to the KD community members so that we can continue to tell all the great stories, all the great work that the KD community is doing. And uh, so for now, thanks for watching. You know the drill. Don't forget to like this channel. Don't forget to share this video with your friends and colleagues and keep watching. Thanks for watching. That was an interesting video. And as you saw that we are going to discuss a lot about what the KD community is doing in the coming weeks, in the coming months. Most probably I'll be going to the academy also to bring a lot of amazing videos that I have been doing at all these uh, commercial conferences. So that's all for today. And thanks for watching. And you know the drill now. Please like and share this video with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you're not a subscriber already. And also, the, uh, just, just, just a reminder that I started a Patreon channel a few days ago. It's still there, so please go there and support my work. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye for now.